thank you for, for uh, taking the time to be with me today. Yeah, th thank you, Paul. Nice to meet you, too. Yeah, it's, it's cool to have you on. Um, you know, we, I came across you on, on LinkedIn and was definitely impressed by your background. Um, I was just saying before that I really want to spend the conversation today learning more about some of the, uh, the skills and the tactics that you've developed over your career to be able to grow from, you know, starting as an account director at Fetch to moving towards CEO. And, um, you know, now you're, you're president at AppSumer. So I'm kind of wondering if, just to kind of kick things off, if we could take things back um, to like 25 year old you and, you know, did, were you, did you have this intentional thought of you wanted to grow your career in this way or how did it kind of, how did you kind of get here? No, I'm, it's, it's, uh, it's, I love the subject on looking back, you know, what I, what I had in mind and, you know, especially in 2020, a lot of people have been comparing, okay, where were you in 2010 and, you know, what has been those, those 10 years and uh, it's, it's, um, for me, I started definitely I wanted to work in marketing. I initially wanted to work more like in product marketing and retail. And then I discovered like that basically e-commerce was already pretty big. And then they were starting to talk about m-commerce, so mobile commerce. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much, you know, I, I my first job was actually at an e-commerce, a French e-commerce um, site called Snack, which is it's still pretty big, but it's like Amazon has, you know, really taking tons of market share on them. But, you know, so I joined them in 2005 and as like a project manager for like launching their first mobile commerce site. So that was basically, yeah, just pre iPhone, you know, just purchasing. <laughs> yeah. So like, you know, it was on Nokia phones and you had to work through that, the, the telephone operators, you know, even Google didn't have like a website, you know, everything was kind of like, wallet garden into like the environment of like the telephone operator and then i i i stayed there for about a year and then i i, I discovered that advertising was starting to be pretty big on, on mobile so then i i joined like i started my career in in, in agencies advertising agencies um, mostly focusing on digital as well as mobile advertising so i joined publicis stayed with them with them for four years and then they offered me a job to move to london and then i moved to london with publicis and then I met the founder of Fetch one day, and then I decided to join them. And then, you know, Fetch was at that time a very small agency. There were like seven people. So for me, like being, you know, uh, Publicis is the third or fourth largest uh, advertising group in the world. So there was like, you know, I, I think I took a, more than a bet, but I really liked the founders, the two founders, James and Declan. And, I think for me it was like well, okay, let's you know I'm I'm young, let's let's join them and see how it goes and and we grew the London agency. They offered me the job to move to the U.S. and then five years later uh, I ended up opening three offices, uh, managing a hundred people uh, across three offices. <laughs> so yeah, it's been it's been a great journey uh, being at Fetch for eight years. Yeah, and, and you you've pretty much been primarily focused on on mobile. I wonder you know if you go back to to 2006, very long time ago. Um, you know, now in 2020, it, mobile is just obvious. It's 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 a necessity. Um, anybody that's in digital marketing understands. Uh, but back in 2006, maybe not so much. Um, was that a? Were there any kind of signals that that you had at that time to make you think this is where the future is going and this is where I want to focus my career? Yeah, I think I think for me, I, I, it's a good question. I think um, where I saw the potential is when I used for the first time Foursquare. You know, Foursquare, mm -hmm. the uh, the geolocate geolocation uh, app, and at that time they were doing like a lot of gamification. You know, giving you badges, and and I was like, dude, like they created a game that is using your mobile phone and that is basically driving you to kind of like telling everybody where you are and like, you know, to great places. And, and I think for me it was like, just, okay, this, this is going to, this is, this is massive. Like you're collecting user data based on their location and what they like and don't like. And I, I think that was for me a clear key signal. And then, and then of course the iPhone, you know, the iPhone has been like such a game changer in the way we are, you know, like the user interface, like the type of apps. And then it's just, it's just been like, uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be there. I would have not had this career if 
you know a technological breakthrough like that would have would have happened would have not happened just you know what i mean so <laughs> yeah, almost like a little bit of luck there almost <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean i think we all got you know got we we all need to say thank you uh for you know an incredible platform and an incredible phone that drove tons of like you know um usage whether it was games or like just you know any kind of apps so uh, i think that has been has been great to ride that way for sure yeah yeah i mean um it's it's very cool because you know i, I was saying before but uh a, a lot of the a lot of people that that are my age that kind of work in the, in the digital space it's been very native to us and you know it's almost like you can't remember a time when mobile phones were not the thing and um you know now the now the usage is so so crazy but you know i'm wondering like like back in those days and and as you grew your career there um were there times that you doubted the the growth um or did you have that confidence to know like we're on this trajectory that if i if i focus my career on on mobile this seems to be kind of the the the, the best skill set for me to <clears throat> to develop yeah I, definitely it was more like providing analytics to to clients you know when you were telling them okay invest develop an app invest in mobile launch like something on on ios and android but then I think the environment in terms of providing analytics and measurement and showing that, you know, users were engaging was challenging. So I remember we were using the company Flurry that I think got, in the end, got acquired by Yahoo. But like Flurry was one of the first mobile analytics that, so I think providing hard numbers, I think the whole analytics and measurement space has developed so much on mobile that now it's kind of like, okay, it's pretty good right pretty but like by that time i can tell you it was not there is no third party analytics no attribution like you could <laughs> you, you could not use google analytics like it was like just that was rough like yeah yeah so and and you were working um kind of like as a an account manager at that time or like you know it's it's, it's interesting you uh, i think a lot about kind of my career and, and where i want to take things right and there i think a lot about like skill set acquisition and so there are the hard skills of learning how to run a, a campaign on facebook um learning how to a, run a, a p l um optimizing um but then there's also these like soft skills of learning how to learning how to fit within company culture learning how to grow a team and i find myself you know looking at people that are kind of in the C-suite, um, whether they be founders or CEOs, VPs. And it seems to me that at that point that the the soft skills actually almost take priority. It's like you've developed um you've developed these 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 hard skills, but now it comes now it's just like how are how am I a communicator? How am I bringing people together? And it's something I think about uh, a lot because it's uh, from my perspective it's like that that skill set of just a particular topic or knowing how to do a particular thing can only get you so far yeah yeah i mean and especially i think we've 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 over specialized certain marketers you know at some point we were running campaigns and we had like okay you are the you are in the social team specialized on like snap <laughs> snapchat and then you are like specialized it's just because there were like multiple user interface different ways you can build campaigns and stuff so i think <laughs> there definitely has been an over specialization but and also a lot of the job was a lot you know manual and tedious and you were using you know different tools to create you know campaigns and 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 i think people were people who are very skilled in like Excel and just SQL and just having like a good knowledge of, you know, pivoting data and being a bit technical, I think they were most successful. I think the soft skills, yeah, I think the soft skills are a lot around, you know, solving issues and problem, right? It's just like, wow, you know, this campaign absolutely has been a disaster. Then how do we, how are we going to like explain, you know, why this campaign didn't perform, what we could have done differently and so on. And I, I think you learn that just, in, you know, as any job, how to manage expectation from stakeholders and so on. So, yeah. um, you've obviously, you've obviously grown teams and been a part of many teams. Are there any kind of like clear characteristics that you can see that define kind of a, 
a high performing team. And um, I guess like if you don't see that, how, how do you make those improvements? Because a lot of times it's like we can we can see what the ideal is, but the reality is, is often far from that. And uh, most of the times, the, the people that are kind of succeeding the most are the ones that are solving those hard problems, right? Yeah, and I think ultimately everything can be told because you can document things and, 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 and train people. But I think if there is one skill I'm trying to identify when I hire people, especially maybe more on the junior level, is like they're intelligent, they're more like um, a curiosity and like how mm. much they actually like will be... <clears throat> How much have they read about things? How much have they really went deep on a subject and are able to like explain, you know, on a particular subject and going pretty deep on the subject? And it could be on 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 anything. I mean, it's better if it's related to marketing and and digital and so on. Since those were the type of skills that was we were hiring for. But I would say just generally like you know being curious and 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 yeah and just you know you, you want to hire people who are like who are really keen to learn and who just also don't wait for you to teach them. They, they will, they will figure things out and just learn also by doing right. A lot. So. Right. So let me ask you then like that, that intellectual curiosity um, in your life, how has that changed from, you know, maybe when you were in an account manager level versus when you first took your first leader leadership position versus like a CEO, I can imagine that, you know, the, the challenges get more complex, but there still remains that intellectual curiosity. Now you're just solving more difficult high level problems. I mean, I'm, I'm going to sound very, very old, but like, I don't know when I was like 10 years ago, 10 years younger, I was reading newspapers. I was like, you know, <laughs> Like I was like, you know, reading blogs. I was like, you know, following feed and stuff. And like, I think it's this, I think people have replaced a lot that, um, okay, being on social media and Twitter and Facebook and get, getting their news kind of like <clears throat> through like their social channels. But I think, you know, it's really about following, you know, key bloggers, people that you believe are key influencers and that you, you, you think are like super like, you know, knowledgeable about one particular subject. And just being in the know and just like knowing that, oh, you know, this thing happened recently and I think it's like forming an opinion mm -hmm. and just being, you know, just overall like super curious about the, the kind of like the market that you uh, you, 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 you work on. Uh, so that's that's one thing that I, I, I don't see. Uh, I see less. I think I think people are spending way too much time with their social network, interacting on looking on Instagram. And yeah. what's what's up with their friends, as opposed to sure. maybe being a bit more shifting their interests on like okay, just things that could be very useful for their career, personal development, uh, just any kind of like you know just just information about a particular topic that could touch their job. Yeah, so. for sure. I'm I'm actually um, I'm really into into meditation, and it's it's kind of been kind of my mm -hmm. life in a, in a lot of ways out, outside of work, um, but. You know, one person that got me into it was Tim Ferriss, and this is kind of an aside, but um, he talks about when he's writing a blog post that he, he wants that blog post to be able to stand the test of time, in a sense, to, um, to write something that 20 years later is still applicable. And, you know, a lot of times when I read different um, educational content about whether it be uh, marketing or product engineering, et cetera, um, there is this difference between kind of like what's hot right now versus this is a, a, a particular like systems way of thinking that can stand the test of time. Um, Brian Balfour is something, somebody that I read a lot of content, of content about growth. And he's somebody that he's developed these, these growth models and, and this way of, of thinking about growth that seems to me you can take in, you know, whether it's, it's TikTok or um, whether it's voice, it's a, it's a new channel, you can kind of put it into his system, but, he still has this like scientific way of, of thinking about things. So yeah. it's, it, I mean, it's kind of, time. it's like, it's like now um, I'm trying to look more towards those like tried and trues. And then you have that framework and then you can kind of fit in all that new information in a more organized methodical way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. And uh, do you, do you meditate every day? 
I Jeb, try to, yeah. yeah. I've I've practiced um, a, a bunch of different types, and it's one of those things. It's almost like it's a bicep curl for for your your mind, and I can I get off it sometimes, but when I'm on it, I definitely feel the the difference. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Yeah, I think um, you know, and it's something. It's it's kind of inter- interesting. Um, when I was when I was 22 or 21, graduating from Cornell. I was thinking about kind of what I wanted to do with my life and um, was looking at like patterns of high performers and was looking at habits of successful entrepreneurs and mm-hmm. meditation mm-hmm. Keep, keep kept coming up. So in my mind, I was like, okay, I'll, I'll meditate, start a business, make a lot of money. Great. Right. Um, and even now, you know, like um, I'm a little bit further in my career. I'm, I'm in a leadership position at a startup and I think more about like teamwork and culture and how is my work impacting the team rather than just like pure, the the pure monetary scope of it, which is always a challenge when you are running a a P&L and you do have performance metrics to optimize off of. Um, The other thing is too, I, I think like one of the challenges about being a digital marketer today is how easy a vanity metric can become. Um, and that's something that, that I struggle with, you know, doing, doing, um, user acquisition. Um, it's very easy to get a good cost per install, but then like what's yeah. happening to, to retention. And so those are kind of, you know, my, my mindset ha- has shifted in this way. Um, part of thanks to Brian Ball for actually. Yeah. 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 And, um, so, so how, how how many how many years have you, have you been managing user acquisition and growth on your side? Is it, is it relatively new, or how many years of experience do you have? No, so I actually um, I started my career in in 2016 um, in advertising as an SDR at a company called yeah. Admiral. Um, oh, yeah. So yeah, pr- a really big programmatic player, and I just got really good at sending um, outreach emails. Uh, <laughs> you know, email sequences, and then moved into an account manager role there. Spent some time at Smartly, also as a senior account executive. They're uh, one of the largest FMPs in the world. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you're familiar. Um, and then I kind of was doing the sales thing for a while, but then I realized that my true skill set is more in the creative side of marketing, um, and I want to get closer to design and to product and to writing copy. And so I kind of transitioned earlier this year. Um, and so I've been basically doing like strict user acquisition, managing a budget for, for just over a year. But, um, you know, it's interesting the, the way my, my brain works now that I've been doing it. I'm like, okay, I figured out cost for install, but like product's interesting too, right? Um, mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's, it's like I continue with this, this intellectual curiosity, right? And I, I feel yeah. like that's, that's, that's the way that you do develop the, the skill set. Um, and, and that's why I'm talking to you. Like, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, you, you, you take these, you grow your career, right? Fetch, you spend eight years there um, and you start as an account director. So you're one of what, you know, you're at a, you're at a small company and then you, you move to the CEO position. Like, were there times you were scared? Were there times that you thought, I'm not sure if I could do this. And how did you kind of, you know, work through that? Um, I mean, I don't think, I, I don't think, um, I, de- scared, definitely not. I don't think you should be scared of, I mean, there are moments of like, that you might find overwhelming just because you have a lot of things to deal with. But, um, I think I, I, I got really lucky to work directly for a long time under the CEO and the founder. So, you know, when Fetch was seven people. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, with when Fetch was uh, seven people, then you know, um, when when the time I became CEO, we were like more than almost two hundred people globally, and the US was hundred people roughly. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I think for me it was like clearly understanding where we were coming from, understanding the culture, what kind of like company we wanted to to build, and then you know, it's um. It's, it was having, you know, there was definitely some new skills that needed to, um, you know, reading a, reading more in depth of PNL, reporting to, you know, a CFO. We, we, we joined Dentsu, which is, so we, we got acquired uh, during this uh, journey. So, 
So the level of reporting we need to provide was too much greater. So yeah, definitely had a lot of things to learn. Yeah, for for sure. Um, and I mean, those all like those are all relatively new skills. Was was the acquisition was the acquisition by Dentsu like what, was that a culture shift? And and maybe maybe I, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on kind of culture shifts as you have spent time in many different companies and like the size of companies um you know i've i've been in a few that have that have grown and i'm at a 15 person company right now we're in the process of uh raising a, a series b um and we're just at that stage and you know i kind of anticipate once we start growing what are the shifts going to be like on culture for one because that tight-knit community is something that you know, it's, it's kind of, you kind of want to hold that sacred in a sense. Yeah, I mean, for, for, for us, I don't think it, has, it was a culture shift because the, the, the original founder, James Connolly, was, you know, uh, he was there and he stayed during the acquisition. And I think, you know, the culture comes a lot top down. I mean, there is, you know, of course, a culture that is, that is built with everybody, but a lot is like, okay, the pace, the, you know, the passion, the the kind of like the vision that the CEO has. So I think that didn't change. And then I think it was more the size. I mean, when we joined them too, we were maybe a hundred people, but it's just like you joined suddenly a company that is um, $3 billion of revenue. Crazy. Like just, so I think you just, you just, it has put things into perspective. I remember when we joined, I was like, wow, we're like, we're like shit hot, you know, growing crazy. We're great. We're amazing agency were like, well, actually we're pretty tiny. We're like 0. point something percent of their entire revenue. So you're like, right. yeah, it's just, you are, li- so th- 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 I think for me, the shock was more how, how, how big of a group they are and how small we were. And, and I actually, we got, you know, we, we really, we really had a great time when, after we joined. So uh, culturally was a bit more corporate, you know, just uh, because, you know, just, yeah. Just you, you have to speak to a bit more assistant, you know, to speak to the right people. You know, there is less like right. a bit more scheduling and stuff. But like, yeah, other than that, I think you know it's part of any company that is growing, right? So you know, change change is uh, is constant. So you know, yeah. for sure. I and um, I, I wonder that maybe uh, what advice would you have when you're at that 15 person stage? Um, if you could go back to that, or and I guess I guess actually AppSumer is pretty small right now, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we're about 20, 25 people, yeah. Twenty five people. So yeah, so I mean, very similar size to to Rally, which is which is where mm-hmm. I'm at. Um, now that you're back at the size, like, do you are there things that you can get done now quicker? There obviously are that you couldn't get done before, <laughs> and yeah. and how do you take advantage of that, right? I mean, it's it's crazy when you. I mean, the smaller the company is, the more like individual contribution is massive. You know, everybody needs to like put on the work. I'm not saying that you know, you know, in large companies, you know, in some large companies you can hide a little bit more. You know, there's like the <laughs> just like it's yeah, it's obvious, right? I mean, it's just like you know, there is a little bit less of attention on certain area of the business. But like when a company of that size, I mean, it's, you know, when something is working, it's collectively it's working. And, and when something is not working, I think you can very quickly understand what's going on and, and come to, you need to manage maybe less with consensus at the size you are, you know, you can take decision quicker. Um, everybody has maybe more access to understanding of the business. I think what I've noticed from the stage of like a team of 20 to 100, there is definitely this moment when you are about 50 people that that's when you start not knowing exactly the name of everyone. You know, you're like walking in the <laughs> office like, shit. And then, and then you're like, ah, you know, like, and then you start, some people are like, well, you know, I've missed the last company meeting. Like communication starts to get a bit less, you know, a bit diluted. So it's, uh, I really enjoy this size, like 20, you know, the, the 20 and growing. And I, I think it's, it's a great size. And, and then after that, you need to adapt and, and make sure you're like overly communicating because, yeah, I think if there is one mistake we probably did is assuming that, 
oh, you know, it's fine. Like communication stays the same. People are informed. Well, actually, no, you need to like be super, like, you know, repeat the message. Just right. make sure that, yeah. Otherwise, people are like, well, I don't know. I have, you know, I don't know where we're going. So, yeah. Um, I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of reading um, Stoicism, which is a, a Greek philosophy. And one yeah. of the, kind of one of the important tenets is, one of the big things that they talk about is, um, being able to like accept what you can control and what you can't control. And so that, that kind of brings up an interesting point. Like at a 25 person company, there's a lot more that you can control. And I guess the signals are more obvious, like, you know, big companies, small companies, there's always challenges and there's always problems to solve. Um, but maybe they're, they're a little bit more apparent, transparent and in your face at that size. Um, like when you're managing a hundred people, um, how do you how do you kind of deal with that unknown of I'm really putting you know seven to ten individuals responsible for other people and now I have to depend on them you know how do you kind of take take this practice of stoicism and 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 do that and and like release to a certain extent right. Yeah, I think I think what I've learned in my journey is that I think I I too much because I was an involved manager that I've grown through an organization. I think I wanted to like sometimes when something was uh, wrong, I was personally involving myself and going straight to it. And then right. and then I understand actually like by doing this, you undermine the team that is also you are managing directly. You know, so. You, and I think what I've learned is also let your team figure out the solution. I was sometimes coming with like, okay, because I've maybe have the most experience in this agency, I'm going to, we're going to fix this issue, but I'm going to tell you what, how we're going to solve it. And this mm. is how we're going to, when actually I think the best way for people to also learn is like, let them sweat a little bit, let them, you know, just, you know, just, yeah, you don't need to like, you, you need to tell them you're aware that you, you pay attention, but like there is a little bit of problem solving that needs to be kind of like managed down and for them to also figure things out as opposed to like, you know, just having all your attention on the issue at any level and going straight to maybe, you know, someone very junior and trying to fix that for them. So that's, mm. you know, just, yeah, taking, I, I, I like that you mentioned like, you know, stoicism because I think it's, uh, it's yeah, you, you probably want to take just a little bit of like uh, time and, and let the team uh, in charge, you know, to to fix an issue as opposed to like just being a bit more like, um, yeah, just involved and uh, and and active on it. Yeah, I think it also um, builds like that individual employee. It builds a different type of skill set. I can think back to when I was at Adroll, 500 person company, part of an FDR team that was 15 to 20 people. Um, we had managers, we had people that would come in and, and train us, very supportive, collaborative environment where we're all kind of working together, you know, because you're in this role with seven other, 10 other people, um, you can have the same things to complain about. You can kind of share best practices. Um, and I, and I kind of wonder, wonder, like thinking back, you know, now I'm at this role where I am, I'm completely in charge of paid acquisition. And, and so the buck kind of stop, stops with me. And they're, they're, I don't have that same level of like support at the same level. There's only one paid acquisition lead at a startup, right? Um, but I think to myself though, so I don't have that same heavy level of training that I would have at a bigger company, but it's also forced me to solve problems on my own. And I think that yep. in itself is actually a pretty useful skill set. But, but some people... I mean, it's great. I mean, some people love that and they recognize this. I remember yeah. like some people that were uh, at Fetch that then went to uh, work at Pinterest. They told me like, honestly, Fetch is not for everyone because you need to make sure that like we don't clearly at our agency, we are not giving like, uh, you know, a handbook. Here is how you're going to do your job, right? I mean, yeah. part of it, yes. But, you know, and because also those who are new jobs, like, you know, there was not many books around how to run your first uh, apps, uh, uh, Apple search app campaign, you know, when they just launched it. <laughs> so <laughs> right. it's like, 
yeah. well, we're going to figure things out. We're going to work with Apple. We're going to launch the campaign and so on. So, so I think, you know, I, I remember talking to him and saying, yeah, I really actually enjoy like the, pro- the kind of like the figuring things and figuring a process, figuring how to launch something, something new. Um, so it's not for everyone. That's for sure. You know, it, those are like new jobs, jobs that didn't exist. Like, you know, when I started at least, so, so yeah, well, we were sending SMS, not, not, yeah. not <laughs> launching, not launching Facebook campaigns. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you basically, your career has spanned how long mobile marketing has existed. Yeah. I think I joined. Yeah. I think, yeah, I mean, yeah, when I started, it was Bluetooth stations that were sending like, <clears throat> Yeah, Bluetooth messages <laughs> to to Nokia phones in 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 any kind of retail store and SMS, um, and then that's it. Google and then Gnome and then some portals. So like you were going on like the AT and T or the Verizon uh, websites, and then this is where you were getting your news. You maybe were seeing a banner, and that's it. There was like the really the early beginning of display advertising. So you could not even like load a website. Right, and and, and I think it's it's. It's crazy because, you know, you think about today, um, there's Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, Twitter, LinkedIn, Quora, Reddit, Google, YouTube, Apple Search, Google Play Store, you know, um, yeah, the amount yeah, of channels. Yeah, yeah. And then and then there there is um, Tune and Adjust and there's MMPs and there's segment there's, there's, yeah, yeah, there's yeah, yeah, an yeah. app flyer right and, and so you know and you if you just google you know how to run uh mobile acquisition like there's just so much information out there um and so it, it's interesting because when i started in this in this role i've i've been at, at um at rally um since since july of last year and just to give you kind of a high level Basically, we're, we're a fintech platform. Um, we take alternative assets, rare collectibles like vintage watches, collector cars, um, sports memorabilia, baseball cards, and we securitize them. So we yep. give um, users, uh, investors, the ability to invest uh, fractional ownership in these kind of rare assets. Um, I've tested uh, a, a number of different channels, and, and now I'm almost coming to this place where I'm going back to focusing on a few and getting those really honed in and targeted before expanding. And I'm wondering, you know, you work with, I'm sure at Appstream where you talk to a lot of clients and part of your job is, is the consolidation of this information. Um, what is your sense on like the balance between making sure you're getting exposure in these different channels versus like making sure that you're not letting things slip as well? Uh, are you talking about the cons- the, um, the the consolidation of advertising towards like maybe large platform like Facebook and Google versus the rest, or or, or what, what, just just to make sure I understand yeah, so your I question? Yeah, I mean even yeah even um, somebody as a, you know I'm I'm basically a acquisition lead, somebody in a head growth role, a, a head of acquisition role at a startup with mm-hmm. um, limited budget, limited resources. How do you think about the balance of we should spend our time on this one channel and, and get this right versus when oh, do yeah. we know that it's time to expand to two, three, and four? Yeah, I mean, um, there were some recent articles that were very interesting. I mean, like the two main platforms for UA at the moment are Google UAC and Facebook, yeah. big time. So I would say if you are spending less than a million a month, I mean, you know, I mean... <laughs> Like, which is a lot of advertisers are spending less than a million a month. I think you're good to start already with those two platforms. And it's funny because they behave totally differently. Like Facebook will give you at the beginning of the campaign, maybe some very promising start that promising numbers that it's, you know, campaign is running and it's performing well and you are attaining your CP, your, 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 your CPA and so on. And then after that, it's kind of like plateau and, and it's getting harder and harder. And then, and then, and then UAC behaves differently. But, you know, we've seen clients like really consolidating, you know, their advertising towards maybe three platforms, mm. uh, Apple, Google, and Facebook, and then keeping maybe 10, 20% for experimentation. So, sure. you know, Snap, TikTok, and, and then some other in-app uh, platform. It's a bit different for games. <clears throat> I think games has much more of a long tail of suppliers when it comes to media partners for running user acquisition. But 
Um, I think, you know, <clears throat> those platforms have such huge reach, uh, Facebook, Google, and Apple search ads, that, you know, if you are beginning, you know, to work uh, and launching some campaign for a new product, I, I think you're like, you, those are like definitely the platform you should focus on and, and keep maybe 10, 20% of your budget for launching some experimentation, maybe with, maybe with an external partner, maybe with someone that has an edge on you, on a new channel, sure. uh, you know, and that's, that's what we've seen most clients do. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's interesting because as a, as a one man team, you know, I, I have to think very, very particularly about the, the resources that I deploy, which is my time. And mm -hmm. I almost think to myself that picking a specific channel, developing a testing strategy around that channel, and <clears> then <throat> taking those learnings and then slowly and very intentionally expanding, I think that's kind of the, the way to go. And yeah, I mean, wh when I was working at Smartly, a, a lot of those clients are, are talking about at, at that level. And I know, know that you've worked with a lot of those enterprise clients as well. I mean, um, the, 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 the startup that I work with were, were a fraction of, of that spend. So it's like, it's interesting, um, in a startup and a head of acquisition role, then it becomes, yes, I'm focusing on this, but then, you know, I'm also focusing on making sure that our, um, relationship with our MMP is good and making sure that we're tracking properly and we just expanded <clears> to Android. So how does that impact the event tracking on adjust? Um, and I think that's a good kind of segue into talking a little bit about AppSumer. Um, cause I know that you started as an advisor, right? So yep. you didn't just become president. You, you started as, as an investor and an advisor. Um, what was that shift that made you realize, like, I want to kind of take a more serious role here and, and come into this leadership position? It's it's uh, it's funny because it's actually uh, so the um, uh, the founder of uh, AppSumer is a guy called Shamel uh, Shamel Lace and actually Shamel was uh, someone I, I managed back in at, in London at Fetch like eight years ago and he was an account yeah. coordinator so someone wow. super junior. yeah and when I was an account director and then the head of product is a guy called Clement and he's the head of product at AppSumer and he was an account manager at Fetch eight years ago so. Basically, when I've seen those guys starting to work together and getting a team together, I was like, okay, I really enjoyed working with those two. And, and I, you know, I, I think what they have in mind and what they want to build as a product uh, is definitely has huge potential. So I was part of like, you know, of, um, some angel investors that put a little bit of money in the business uh, last year. And then, um, yeah, decided to join them full time. Uh, first, because I think it's a great product and what we are solving, I think, is needed. So it's definitely for teams that are, you know, more like small to medium size um, uh, apps um, that have maybe a limited type time of, um, uh, of resource in terms of running UA. So usually maybe they don't many have like a, a resource from a data team or a business intelligence team. So we basically aggregate campaigns. Uh, from all the media partners, from your attribution partner, as well as any kind of additional source of data, maybe it's your revenue and so on, and then we aggregate all this, we normalize it, and then we provide great dashboard and reporting for our clients, you know, for them to run you in more easily. So we are in the business of data aggregation and data visualization for user acquisition. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a software, so we, we purely built the software that we then license to our clients, and you know, so far we had like, you know, great traction. We have like, you know, we work with Viber, Gameloft, a lot of gaming companies, um, you know, so, um, so yeah, that's, uh, for me, I wanted to work with like people that I believe in and I, on a product that I think has huge potential. So that's why I joined them. Okay. Interesting. Um, and do you, do you, do you see the, the software kind of continuing in this kind of like small to medium size or do you see this being a, a particular play for for enterprise in in the future yeah i think you know we already have clients who are enterprise i think there is like definitely a market in the u.s that is underserved which are like you know mid-sized apps you know small medium gaming studios or, or companies that you know just uh, um have you know a limited amount of resource so we, we we are focusing on servicing this market at the moment 
and and then you know we we will be we are all already also providing those services for web uh, uh, e-commerce companies. So I think extending outside of apps will be our next stage, mm-hmm. and then doing more work on like the optimization of campaign and doing like you know being able to change bids and budgets straight in our platform is something we work on already. So yeah, just doing more like a similarly to like you mentioned, I think uh, smartly, smartly is an FMP. Sure. Yeah, we we are we are not going into like uh, a full FMP uh, type of development, but at least doing some features that can help you to do some certain change at the campaign level straight into a software. I think is is something which is valuable that we are developing. Like something along the lines of using data from Adjust to inform a budget change in Facebook. Yeah. 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 Okay. Mm-hmm. That uh, yeah that that makes sense and. Um, you know, smartly was kind of my foray into into the world of Facebook, and um, I, I realized what a what a very smart job Facebook did to to kind of launch that program to to give access to their API like that. Um, yeah. To to give that as a as a play, it's, it's super interesting. Um, I wonder as at like the stage that you're at, um, you know, I joined and I, and kind of I, I want to talk SaaS for for a second, maybe like on the call on that because um, I spent a lot of time in in that space. Um, the the stage that you're at, it's a it's a bit smaller, and you know when you're when you're thinking about scaling a SaaS company, you kind of are you have the side of the engineers, kind of product finance, whatever, and then and then sales. I wonder, you know, at what are what are the indicators for you that you know you need to hire more engineers versus that you need to hire more um, salespeople, and like how do you think about that that balance as you scale? I think um, for us, you know, as a, we're a software business, everything is like, you know, we need to invest in the product, in the engineer, um, because, you know, just you can't, you, you can't have, you know, if the product is not good enough, you know, client churn, and then it's, you know, it's it's worth, it's not worth it to build a business. So I think like our attention is clearly on product and tech. Um, we, you know, we've hired like a VP of marketing last year. That is helping us with, um, you know, demand generation. We have a sales team in, in the U.S., sales team in the U.K. But actually, you know, we've done most of our business outside of the U.K. Like 70% of our clients are in Europe, outside of the U.K. You know, we have clients in in Slovakia, in Israel, in Russia, and like so. There is a lot of like, there, yeah, there are hundreds and hundreds of clients uh, of of prospects that are looking for this type of software because that doesn't really exist. I mean. There is, you know, there is Datarama. There is like businesses that are helping with data connectors, um, but not as granular and as, you know, hasn't been designed for UA teams. Um, so to your question, I think, you know, yes, sales and marketing as any SaaS business is an important, uh, you know, organization. But like at this stage, you know, I'm doing a lot of the sales, a lot of the BD. You know, we're <laughs> still like in a startup, startup mode. So, you know, sure. uh, I think everybody is like, you know, just, uh, just, Everybody is a salesperson at the moment. <laughs> like, I love that. I love that. I mean, um, you know, I, I have to imagine that that you kind of um, assumed that that was going to happen as part of joining a, a small startup. And like, I'm sure, yeah. you know, like hearing you talk and, you know, after you, you spend some time at the, a larger company, it's like, I'm excited to kind of get back into this. This I'm, I'm selling a little bit. Um, it's got to, it's got to feel pretty good to get back in, into into that hustle um you know i mean it's I hard that. it's so hard it is hard <laughs> i gotta tell you because you're like yeah it is it is really about it back to being you know just okay you are you are managing your team but you are you know everybody is contributing and i'm not you know at, at like you know it's very clear that you know you need to push things and and work hard it's like way harder to go from zero to a million dollars of revenue, then, sure. then, then, yeah, there's definitely some steps in the business that have been really good to, uh, to do, and it's just, yeah, it's just, it just, it, it is, it is rewarding, very rewarding to do this for sure. So maybe I, I think, um, I think I'll, I'll end because we're, we're, you know, about 47 minutes here. I think I'll, I'll end with, with this question, and, and this isn't actually for myself, but, um. You know, I'm I'm hearing you talk, and so maybe for for somebody that is uh, that's at a larger company right now, um, that spent a, a majority of their career um, in in a more corporate environment, 
um, and maybe has that little bit of a, a startup itch, but they're not sure. Mm -hmm. um, they're not sure, you know, they, they, they maybe they've gotten used to the brand of like working at Facebook and not having to pitch as hard, maybe, um, you know, not having to be as persuasive. Um, what would you say to somebody like that, whether that be an engineer or product person or salesperson? I mean, for me, I wanted to do it because I didn't want to have any regret. I wanted something that was, that was, that is high risk, high reward. And I, you know, I think as long as if you meditate on it and you're like, okay, if it fails, if it doesn't work out, that's fine. I can, you know. The market is still pretty good. I can still get a job tomorrow. Do you see what I mean? Like you can still come back to a corporate job mm. if this is what you're currently in. It's likely you can. Um, but I think what I joined, there are not many companies that could offer this type of opportunity. And also for me, where I de-risk my decision is knowing some of the key people in the business. So I knew sure. the CEO, I knew the head of product. You know, it's not like you're joining any kind of startup you're joining a startup that is that is with people you've worked in the past and mm. and i think for me it was like a way for me to just yeah just knowing strongly that it was a good decision sure uh, yeah I, I i've seen this like time and time and again and i mean i, th I think about my career and i'm and i'm excited to, to grow at rally but you know in in the future if i work at different positions to it it seems to me that it's it's the people and, you know, there's, there's easy, it's easy to get sucked up in the job title. And obviously you're at an executive position. So it's a little bit, you know, where, where I'm at, I, I could very easily get in, in three years, two years, get sucked into like a, a VP role and, and think, you know, I could take this VP role right now, or I could work at this company and not have that same job title, but the people and the, and the product I'm a little bit more passionate about. It's like you yeah. gotta remind yourself why you're why you're doing it too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Cool. Um, thank you, uh, thank you so much for for taking the time to to chat. No, it was my pleasure, Paul. That was very nice. Very, I enjoyed a lot. So thank you for thank you very much, Paul.